Hello, this is Ricky here from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and you're watching Teacher Learning Cast with Peter Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. So there you go. Teacher Learning Cast, uh, episode number 14. Today is June 9th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart from beautiful Aguas Calientes. Today, my partner in crime, Petey Herrera, is not here currently, but he will be here shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to uh, provide a few announcements. And uh, the first being in Mex uh International Conference, the 45th International Conference, in fact, uh, is scheduled for this year, October 25th through the 28th, 2018 in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco. Also the Anupi 16th International Conference for English Teachers, uh, the Internationalization and Digital Learning Perspectives and Challenges in the ELT is going to be on uh, October 18th, 18th through the 21st, 2018 and in beautiful Hualtulco, Mexico. So if you happen to be interested in attending some of those, uh, that would be great, I think, We'll be trying to attend one of those uh, this year and uh, look forward to that. Um, if you are just joining us, feel free to leave comments. Uh, this is a uh, basically open uh, forum for all teachers to share their experiences and opinions, all things related to education. Uh, Biddy and I are specifically teaching in a BA program in ELT, English Language Training. So most of our topics are geared towards English language learning, but uh, we also address a lot of topics that are uh, more open uh, to, uh, to general education as well. So feel free to leave comments, uh, whether you're uh, joining us in the live broadcast or if you are uh, joining us or just watching the recording, uh, feel free to give us some input, let us know uh, what, you, uh, what you like, uh, your opinions about different topics. And if you'd ever like to join us during a live broadcast, feel free to do that as well. We're always looking for uh, guests to join our um, our broadcast. And we've had some great uh, interviews in the past, discussions in the past uh, with both teachers in training and service teachers as well as pre-service teachers. Uh, we'll be starting here officially in, the, in just a few minutes, um, but today's topic, uh, one of the topics that I wanted to discuss uh, relates to uh, output driven uh, the high, the output driven hypothesis and uh, we'll be getting into that here in just a few minutes uh, we're just starting actually concluding classes uh, this uh, this week and so students are preparing for final exams and uh, the month of June is usually really crazy around this time of year um, but uh, this month we're going to continue trying to broadcast every Saturday. So really leave us comments in the, uh, in Facebook. You can join us in Facebook by just searching teacher learning cast and you should be able to find, uh, find the web page there. And you can also reach me at benjaminlstewart.com, uh, dot wordpress.com. You can contact uh, pd at homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash pdha. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us either uh, via Facebook or you can uh, send us uh, correspondence through our personal web pages. Guess we'll go ahead and get started here. And uh, I want to go ahead and share my screen. The first topic I wanted to talk about, in fact, when I was uh, going through some of my readings uh, this week, trying to come up with some topics to discuss. Uh, this was the first uh, blog post that I came across that, that, uh, that I wanted to share with you uh, this week. And uh, the title of this post is Helping Students See the Point of Writing. And the, the, one of the, the main points of this post was really trying to incorporate writing more into the general English learning classroom. And I think this is one of the main points I wanted to come up, uh, share with you is what kind of emphasis do we place on writing? Now, it could be academic writing, could be business writing, 
could be creative writing, if it's in the case of maybe poetry. Uh, it doesn't always necessarily mean just academic writing. What kind of writing uh, do we place in, in our English language learning context? He says, I, I honestly don't feel that I have had a lot of options and I decided to be innovative. To me, this was the only option. I was definitely going to make my students create a newspaper and write an editorial on a collaborative uh, Google Doc. And the point of this particular article was how the writer tried to incorporate uh, the creation of a newspaper, really trying to find that one performance task where students could rally around and uh, work collaboratively and cooperatively to create a product that was a collective effort. And I think the key point here is to try to find that those, those key activities where students can come together, of course, using Google Docs, uh, is a really good way of doing that because it has that collaborative effort where you can, I think, have up to 50 people or students collaborating at any one time. So it really lends itself well to working together, have students come together and uh, create this, this product, uh, in this case, a newspaper. And one of the things I wanted to kind of ask the community here is what, what effort, what kind of focus do you place on writing in, in your own classroom with your students? And are, is there or are there certain activities that you can create and have your students work together? Or maybe you've done this in the past and, and you could share that with, with us. But what, how do you create those activities where students come together? Now, maybe technology is going to be an issue here. So the, the question is going to be also, what kind of access do your students have to uh, to to maybe create uh, a Google Docs, and you know maybe the issue is that there's not a lot a lot of technology in the schools, um, and maybe technology might be more available outside of the class, perhaps either in their homes or some other maybe a internet cafe or or some sort. Maybe they don't have access at all to any type of technology. So the question is going to be, well, how can this collaborative, this way of working collaboratively together, how can this uh, be part of the English language learning experience without technology? And so whether there, you have technology available or not, what kind of activities can you bring together that would foster the promotion of, of writing um, in, in any of, uh, of the senses? Like if it's, again, uh, academic types of writing, or, or just business type, or maybe just personal, maybe social types of correspondent. It might even be writing assignments that re relate to how they interact online, maybe even in Facebook. You know, and, and again, if they are not having a lot of access to technology, it's, more, it's gonna be more like trying to find where they're at, how they communicate, and how you want them to learn how to communicate, but through, uh, through writing. After reading this particular blog post, I came across this article here, Exploring Construction of College English Writing Courses from the Perspective of the Output-Driven Hypothesis. And I found this, uh, this article interesting. Uh, the main thesis here is that reading to writing activities based on the output-driven hypothesis, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, helps students consolidate and internalize linguistic and, and stylistic knowledge uh, acquired in reading. And the first thing they mention, they really talk about three different hypotheses. The first being the input hypothesis from crashing. And there's been a lot of talk about this hypothesis, and I see it all the time. Uh, a lot of educators, a lot of English language teachers subscribe to Krashen's input hypothesis. The, uh, the idea of comprehensible input, uh, the I plus one, teaching slightly beyond the current level of the, of the of the learner, and um, it's basically this idea of focusing on input before output, and it comes from this idea of uh, acquiring L1, where the notion is that uh, we typically receive a lot of input before we uh, produce any output. And I would personally argue that uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to the input hypothesis in the sense that 
even as a baby, you know, we can, you know, there's been a lot of research on baby talk. And I feel that even from day one, you know, babies are, are communicating whether, you know, any, it, whether it's under being understood or not is another matter, but they externalize, they are, uh, they're crying, they're trying to communicate with someone else from the very beginning. And yes, they're uh, constantly receiving a lot of, a lot of input, whether they understand it or not. But the idea is to try to transfer that idea to the L2 context, learning an additional language where one, a person has already acquired one language is now and, and is now trying to acquire a second language, um, I think is um, a stretch, to put it one way. Um, I, I'm trying to imagine even in the classroom where in the input hypothesis, the idea is that let's, the students are going to spend a whole semester, 16 weeks, just focusing on, on input. Uh, I don't think it's realistic, and I'm, I don't even necessarily think it's beneficial. So I think the input hypothesis has some credibility in the sense of the comprehensible input notion. I think uh, the I plus one teaching slightly beyond the uh, the notion of the, the learner is, I think, almost a given. I think, you know, most of our classroom uh, context, we can see where students most of the time are only understanding a percentage, a, a smaller percentage of what's what's being said. And I think if, you know, I think most teachers can intuitively see that if students are understanding 100% of what's being said in the classroom, that the adjustments would quickly be made. So I think the norm is the I plus one uh, in, in, most, in most cases. Yeah, so, so the author moves from the input hypothesis to the output hypothesis coming from Swain. So 10 years later, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Swain is talking about the output, where the output is more important than, than the input, even from the very beginning, even from a lower level of, of development. Um, it says that out of the language, uh, raises learners' awareness of their linguistic uh, difficulties in the second language development. So it's, it's really looking at how students are finding, they're kind of becoming aware as they're creating this output of where they need to be, where they would want to be as a language user versus their current level. And it's bringing together this idea of a hypothesis testing. The output facilitates learners' hypothesis testing, right? So that they are, this awareness or this meta-awareness is, is really uh, more easily uh, obtained as students are trying to create their, their language. And, uh, you know, I can certainly uh, relate to that. I think most of us can relate, that, relate to this as uh, L2 learners that we kind of recognize now whether or not we know the specifics of the, 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 the language, but we know that we're making mistakes and that we're not speaking in, in the best way, right? Or the mo most ideal way. So, so this idea of Swain is really to focus change, to shift from the input and focus more on the output as a way of learning and, and improving one's speech. Now, the third point here is where the author is uh, really leading up to, and, and it's this idea of output input or output driven hypothesis, where um, the, the idea, there's basically three assumptions. The first assumption is that output has greater driving force in learners' development of foreign language abilities than input, right? So it's the output is really the driving force. It's the reason, it's the purpose for, um, for even uh, have you know reading or uh, listening to to anything, and I, we haven't really spoken about this pity specifically, but I think it really underlines much of what we talk about when we speak about performance tasks and really trying to uh, design as an assessment tool these products or processes beforehand, so that students are really learn uh, leading up to that those experiences. I think it's kind of embedded into this output driven hypothesis here. Uh, the second point they want they make here in the article is that um, it's more significant to develop students' productive skills, that is uh, speaking and writing and maybe even translating, uh, than it is to cultivate their receptive skills like reading and listening. Um, so I, that's that's a very uh, important aspect 
or assumption of this hypothesis. And the last one being the output oriented integrating teaching method, right? So they compare this to uh, the traditional ways of maybe uh, looking at teaching individual skills or skills individually, whereas you kind of integrate the four skills as a teaching method. And I think this is another interesting aspect that uh, might cause us to reflect on our own teaching, like what kind of, you know, um, what kind of approaches do we take in our, our classroom in terms of skills? Do we treat skills individually and we spend one or two days on listening and one day on reading and another day on speaking? Or do we try to bring those four skills together along with grammar and vocabulary and pronunciation and we bring those together uh, on a daily basis. And so where we're, we're not really isolating the skills, but we're really trying to bring together and lead towards this output to a degree, whether it's small periods of output, right? Because I could certainly see, you know, I, uh, types of activities where over the course of the week, there are certain types of uh, output that's being had from the students and then leading up to more of a a complex type of output towards the end of the, the week or at the end of the unit. Um, but I find it interesting in this article, um, and again, I found this article in Eric, uh, Eric, I think it's, in fact, uh, let me pull it up here, the exact website, eric.ed.gov. Okay, so this is a an open database uh, from the United States government, and you can find a lot of articles there. And I found this article there, so if you're interested, you can find it there. Um, but I, I like how this article really links the input hypothesis, compares it to the output hypothesis, and then leads up to this output-driven hypothesis, because I think that this is really in line with the, the initial question I had this week, which is, how can we incorporate writing into the classroom, and I and I don't necessarily mean writing as a focus only on writing, but I, I have a tend I have a feeling that writing might be uh, neglected in some context in the general English classroom um, for various reasons, and and I I think we could come up with an easy list of reasons why that that is, but but I'm just I I'm curious how others feel about this idea of bringing in writing and regardless if it's academic writing, it could be business writing, could be creative writing, it could even be writing based on, uh, you know, how students are interacting in social media, if they have, if they're writing, you know, even in short uh, blog posts uh, to each other or even short correspondence through, through social media. But to, to not neglect writing, but to look at it as a reason to focus on the the rest of the skills, the reading skills, of course, uh, the listening skills, even the speaking skills, and just again finding ways to bring in all of the skill development through these types of activities, with the idea that it's it's all based on output. So, Pity, I don't know if you what you have uh, seen in some of your tutorial sessions or your own experiences with uh, teacher trainers. But this idea of writing, is it, it, do, we, do we have activities? Do we have like uh, experiences with teacher trainers that bring in all four skills and especially writing? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, I would there, Ben, and, and uh, hello everybody. Sorry for, for being a little bit late, uh, but I'm here. <laughs> uh, I guess, Ben, I would dare to say that especially in in many many places here here in mexico uh and uh i i really wouldn't know about other parts in the world but at least here in mexico and the experience i had and people i've talked to and the kind of educational system we had had led us to uh matching uh an input approach in which everything is mostly based on, well, I think we have mentioned this before, the ability of the teacher to understand the topic and present a topic as a source of information. And that leads totally to an input approach in which uh, sometimes uh, the teachers don't even care about a context and just put out the information and with a good hope that students 
would be able to match that information with the real opportunities when they actually face them. And, and many, many times we even leave, leave uh, students with the responsibility of uh, understanding at the moment of the real need of the use of the language that that's the moment when they're going to use something that was exposed or presented by the teacher. Uh, so I'm wondering, I'm sorry, Pity, I, I wanted to ask because you mentioned something really interesting and I have a question here. I mean, can you have context based on an input driven classroom? If you're focusing more on input, is, is it possible to even create a context? Uh, it, yeah, I, I think you can have a context there, but, but, um, but the, idea would be the, way it's I mean, the idea would be the delivery that uh, the teacher is, may not be just uh, enforcing a context, but giving the students uh, like a format mm -hmm. in a context that the teacher is having in his mind, according to what the teacher believes and what the teacher wrote or, or prepared for the class and, uh, and being just another a parallel information to the linguistic, uh, to the linguistic aspect. We have the language itself and we would have the context, but presented just as information presented to students. I think that that may, uh, may also work like that. Uh, me bringing the context out is that the idea would be not just to bring the context and, and put the information there about, let's say, uh, health or going to the doctor and presenting a conversation or something that the teacher actually presents, but creating a situation uh, as a contextualization for students to actually create their own language and their own opportunities within the context. So it would be like, uh, yes, the idea from the teacher is to present the context, but, but just to, to put the, the cards on the table and have the students play with them and bring their own cards to the table. Yeah. I, I, I made that, myself clear in that sense. Yeah. And I, I think that you said something there that, when the students create the language, for me, that's when the context is created. I mean, I think okay. that student yes. teachers, they can present, if you want to say present a context. Okay? Right. But I think, I think the, the, the idea about the word context and what that means and what it really, mm -hmm. you know, for me, what it means in, in a very practical sense. Right. Means that it occurs when students create something and and it goes back to the output driven hypothesis yeah i would agree on that totally on that. that if if we're focusing more on the input um i think that we're missing something we're not giving students the the, the chance here because again this is i don't know if you caught really the earlier part of uh what i was talking about with regard to input hypothesis but um i think that's one of the shortcomings uh, you know, there are a lot of people, I see this online all over, uh, people are really subscribing to Krashen's input hypothesis, right? Where, again, the derive is, you know, we have to understand before we can produce. And so as, as uh, babies, we are, you know, soaking up all this information. If we look at it from an L1 standpoint, le learning our native language, that we're just soaking up all this information before we, before we uh, externalize, before we communicate. But... I really don't think that that's even the case because babies, we both have kids and I know uh, you can relate to this, that, you know, babies are, are communicating from day one, whether we understand what they're saying or not, right. they are externalizing their input. They're that based on whatever they're receiving as input, they're externalizing it through crying or whatever. Yeah, gestures. And I, and I would add to that, how much can they, uh, really grasp from whatever input you present to them, right? At that stage, I think right. I would of go course. with the idea that they can uh, have more output from themselves than whatever they can grasp in math. At certain, yeah. at certain, yeah. after a while, that would be like like a different issue to talk about the kids. But yeah, it's a good example. But I, yeah. I, I believe there are different levels in the context, in the kind of context, and and different different levels. And I totally agree with you in the sense that that the actual content we want to get and the meaning we want to get in class is not the one that the teacher is presenting there. It's the one that the students bring up and, and not as a group, 
as individuals. Uh, if you remember, we already talked about this romantic idea of, of uh, I think it was, um, uh, oh, I just forgot the name. Uh, but but he, uh, we, we mentioned the idea of having this spontaneous conversation with the students by their will. And that's what I meant by having them bring their cards on the table. Now, I also believe that, yeah, teachers can have the idea of how they want to contextualize this, their class. But it, yeah, I, I totally agree on that. It, I, I would see it as a, a different level of uh, context in the class, like, uh, like we mentioned, different levels in the sense of a wide topic and a specific situation or a specific uh, language for a specific moment. Yeah, we would also have different dimensions of um, how, would you, how would I put it, like proof, like deep, like profound uh, context in it, which uh, what we want to get is actually students bringing their own individual context uh, in, in which they match, they match the language to create uh, 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 learning in a way that it's endurable. Yeah. And yeah. Well, well, I, yes, go on. Go, well, yeah, I was just going to say, and from a very practical standpoint, thinking about the teaching practice, uh, if there is a focus on input, and if there if there is a focus on listening and and reading over uh, writing and speaking, right? So, my question then would be, how do we even assess? the students because right. the only way we can assess any type of receptive skill is through production what whatever that production looks like right whatever right. we want to call it and 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 I'll be the first to admit there's there's good production over bad you know there's di there's a difference between good production and bad production or or good practice and poor practice but you know this idea of trying to focus on input over output um I think it's a fool's errand. I think uh, I just don't see. I don't see it, um, and in any practical, even a productive sense or efficiency sense. And I, I would like just to bring uh, up very quickly. Uh, I, I have a comment here by Alma Lucia Leyland Marin in in Facebook, and she's mentioning that uh, she writes a lot of IT systems user guides, uh, and she's a tra as a trainer uh, where she works. And she says that it's not an, an easy task, but it's kind of rewarding uh, to know that the staff depends on the way she documents the information. And, and, uh, and I can see it's kind of um, important uh, for the teacher, again, to be part of, of this planning, to be a source of information, to, be, uh, to, trend, to share something with the rest uh, of people. I, I, I would go through this idea in the sense that, uh, yes, there will be situation in which students depend on that, or maybe not the students, but users in this case. They, they depend on this to have a base and a starting point, but, but going to the idea that actually we have them uh, maybe starting from there, but growing and, and, and being able to go beyond whatever you can present to students. That would be my opinion in that sense. Uh, many things come to my mind when we uh, when you are talking about this uh, open driven hypothesis, and uh, and yes, it's something that it also happens in, with teachers' information uh, when we have activities and they decide to have less control activities before uh, more control activities. And uh, I remember some years ago the first time that this happened. I tended to tell them we the idea that we have is to go from control to freedom and and there are theories about it and even I remember we talked about last last week we talked about um, uh, the stages in the experiential learning and uh, and and as part of the national education program and they also have this idea of the control to freedom and leading people in in that sense. But with time, I, I've come to see that it's, it's not always like that. And, and right now in teaching worship, in fact, in last presentations, I had some examples in which students came with output activities, less control activities in which they have students doing the things and then going backwards from what they uh, can achieve or not, the teacher starts to scaffold and help, uh, uh, help them in, in different ways and sometimes uh, the last activity in the classroom is just the 
actually uh, uh, control specific presentation of the grammar or formula or whatever, but just as a reinforcement. And what we discuss in here is how the teacher come to this decision of putting first an output activity, a less control activity in which students make all the decisions and start to there to use whatever the teacher presents. Uh, and then afterwards have a more control activity of substitutions or things like those. And it's interesting that sometimes they do it like uh, not really conscious about it. And some others, they actually think, I just wanted to challenge them and see how much they knew about the topic. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point and a, some, a good approach to see, because I think a lot of times we assume students are all more or less at the same level. So how are we going to know if they're at different levels? Well, we ask them to uh, produce something. And, you know, that's kind of on a small scale, focusing on the output driven uh, yeah. hypothesis on a very small scale, just to kind of maybe even as a diagnosis tool to see what level they are they're at. We could expand that and look more long term and think of it in terms of a performance test, thinking, okay, we want our students to be able to produce something um, uh, and, but and have smaller degrees of output that lead into, you know, kind of looking at it holistically there. But um, I think, the the notion of the input hypothesis would be that the input comes first and and i guess my question would be look and think in just a rhetorical question like looking at teacher training um what's the justification or how do we implement focusing only on on input and i think a lot of the conversations i've seen online it takes it to the extreme it's not even like we're talking about what we're discussing today Right. Uh, just on a small scale, it's looking at some, you know, some people are suggesting that a full semester of an, uh, of a level one English class should be only listening and reading. Right. right. I mean, and, and, and there are a lot of people that subscribe to that notion with the idea that they don't know anything. So they have to, you know, have all this input first and then level two, they're going to all automatically now start being able to, you know, start practicing and, and that would be the ideal way because that's how we learn in the L1. And that's kind of what I'm arguing against. But, but, I, and, but and, and it's it's what I was mentioning that happens in Mexico and we can see uh, most, in many, many classes, the students are struggling to actually speak because they are not speaking in the classroom. They don't, they are actually not speaking. If they do so, they're just answer short answers uh, uh, or, or just no questions. And they pretty much understand, but they are struggling with the speaking. I, and, and sometimes we have students in, 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 in for example, in certain courses, uh, if let's, let's put a number, 10 levels, and they are in level five, and they are still not speaking. And, because, and, this is the, yeah, and it's a struggle. My point is that it's a struggle after, when you want to change it afterwards, and this I have seen in, in, in my observations with my practitioners, they struggle later to make them participate. And then they Good. have to fight back to something that was created by themselves. They have to fight back against not, not speaking and not having this output. And, uh, and, and then in, in their reflection, they come to the idea that, oh, I should have uh, spent more time in output skills since the very beginning. Well, and, and, this, and this is what I want everyone to think about when uh, think about the, the input hypothesis versus the output hypothesis. Right. We can all agree that we've seen cases where students are lacking uh, speaking skills and writing skills, right? They, they, they're not fluent. They're not able to speak. So the question is going to be one or, or one or the other. It's going to be if you're on the input hypothesis side, you're going to say, okay, students aren't able to speak because they have not received enough input. If you're on the output side, you're going to say students aren't able to speak because they haven't had enough opportunities to speak. So my, that's the question I want everyone to think about if, if, if they're on the fence of, okay, I'm on the input hypothesis side, then yeah. your answer to that question, my, the reason why this student can't speak is because they haven't been able, they haven't received enough input. Right. Versus the the the. the oh, this 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 brings me to one of the comments I had noted, and one and one question that we have, and I think this question is for you, 
because my, my note was about going towards students' individual um, uh, characteristics and personality, uh, again, as the basis for input or output. Because I was thinking about, all right, what about if you ask them, if, if, if you start with this output skills and you kind of lead them toward like less control activities, but they start to get frustrated. What about the backwash effect they have when the, uh, and, and, and what if the students cannot cope with it or the teacher does not have the ability to help them cope? Uh, this may be frustrating and may lead to students uh, hating the language. And, and we, I, I mean, that, that this, this was uh, the, the, the way I would put it, but we have a question from, from Alma here that uh, she says that when, uh, when she writes documents, uh, the, the, the kind of documents mentions uh, the IT system uh, user guides, she always thinks about the reason why she's doing this. And, and her question is that it, it, if that's the kind of questions the teachers have for students when they assign writing assignments, if they actually uh, guide or tell the students or make the students wonder themselves what, why they're doing this. And I think this somehow brings into the table uh, the student as as the main source and uh, and and their characteristics, their context again, their purposes for writing, and, and I somehow thought this match. So, what about that then? Um, yeah, and and let me know if I'm addressing uh, the question here. If I get off off base here, um, but. I think that this, a couple of things come to mind. So some students are going to be more introvert versus extrovert. Uh, and it's going to depend on their personalities. You know, some are going to be more outgoing, some are going to be shyer, et cetera. So it, there's always this issue about how to, you know, motivate both types of students to produce, again, whether it's writing or speaking. But I think this speaks a lot to the notion of flipped learning, which we've talked about. Uh, okay. With Ken Bauer a lot about this and, and about how we can deliver not only deliver the the course the content but we can also decide on how students deliver their own speaking or writing uh, skill sets and we can figure out ways we can give variety and again I'm, I'm going back to technology and we can argue I know some are not going to have access to technology but the idea here is to find ways to differentiate and provide freedom of choice so that students are able to participate in different ways, okay? And, and we as educators, will, I know, will need to find ways to assess all of these, uh, you know, uh, yeah. these different ways. But the idea is that students have different entry points, that is, they can they can enter into the learning experience from different perspectives and angles and, and be able to participate in ways that hopefully are more, uh, you know, purposeful for them. And I think one of the things that I always ask my teacher trainers is when you're teaching a class, always be prepared to answer the question is, well, why are we doing this teacher, right? A student may ask, why are we doing this? So there needs to be a clear purpose in why we're doing this. And that purpose can be on a grand scale if we're looking at a performance task, or it can be a very small scale thinking, okay, we're, we're just trying to be able to, uh, you know, produce this one particular grammatical structure or whatever. So we're gonna do this type of activity in order to do that, and so that later we can do this. But the idea is to kind of help the students look at their learning from different perspectives Right. So that they can kind of identify short-term goals versus long-term goals and and how to match those individual goals with classroom goals and uh, and really trying to motivate them to to produce. And, you know, I've seen this in my own classes where st some students really thrive and do well in certain types of activities while others don't. And it's really just trying to offer enough variety in the class and a different variety of types of language uh, activities in different ways to participate and really trying to reach out and, and know the students well enough to be able to determine and plan those types of activities and again i'm talking really general and abstractly right. here without having a, a very concrete example but but the idea uh with i think her question is i think looking at it from 
the teaching aspect, differentiating the, 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 the learning experience and flipping the classroom using technology so that they have different ways of participating uh, online. And I'll, I'll just conclude with a very quick example in my own class, which might help is, you know, I have some students that use technology, others don't, some use their mobile device in class, some don't. But I have uh, writing classes where I have some students and they like to participate by writing in their notebook. They don't like to have their work uh, on the screen, which we are lucky and fortunate enough in our context to have screens in our classrooms where we can demonstrate and show other students' work to the whole group. So some students really, uh, I feel, don't have much of a problem having their work being shown to the whole group, which I ide ideally like as a teacher because I can, I can show mistakes that one student makes and ma turn that into a learning moment. Um, but other students are intimidated by that and they don't like to have their errors shown to the whole group. So they either just show it on their own device without sharing it to the Google Doc or they write it in their notebook. So I can accommodate those, all those possibilities very easily um, in, in my class. And I feel that, that doing that, you know, the shy students, I think, feel more comfortable because they are asking questions whereas they might not ask questions if I only say, okay, the only way I'm going to give feedback is if I show it to the whole class and share it with everybody else. Right. You're right. Again, we are going to the individuality of the students, and, uh, and, and that was pretty much uh, what I wanted to address because uh, you were mentioning you, you, uh, whether you lean towards the input or the output. Uh, would I crack if I'm in the middle? <laughs> the thing is that I, I always consider theories like um, – uh, like something I can grasp from knowing that uh, many of the times this, especially in language learning, these theories are not really developed in my context, <laughs> in, in, in my Mexican context. But yeah, there are a lot of, uh, uh, as we have seen several times, there are a lot of things you can grasp and, and you can take advantage of. And, um, and, 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 but I go back to the idea of, of, having the student as the center in the sense that mm, their personality is going to lead to towards the need of having maybe more exposure to the input or or daring to to have a time trying to do things even though they are they don't have all of the tools and they can handle this uh, interaction with constant interaction and, and well this is something that just came to my mind and also goes towards the positive side of the output is going to force the interaction with the teacher in order to um, in order to get the necessary tools to complete the these kind of uh, uh, projects or tasks or activities you want to develop uh, towards uh, focusing on the output. But on the other side, there are students which uh, may have a hard time on on this kind of interaction with the teacher. Uh, in, in fact, uh, what I was going to discuss today, that, that I think I can leave it for next week, uh, I, I wanted to talk about some ideas uh, in reference to demands and support for students and the different types of demands. And, and, some of, and some of the students, the interactional demand, the effective demand that the tasks imply may be blocking even the development of the linguistic demand of the language itself. So uh, I, I, I here again go towards the idea of uh, knowing your students. You have to know your students in order to, or you, uh, in order to determine uh, what's exactly what is going to happen in the classroom when you do certain things. Uh, yeah, and, and you mentioned, and I totally agree. I mean, we, we do need to try to know our students as much as possible. Um, I take that another level, though. I want to I, I, knowing our students. I mean, I think is um, certainly we want to know our students, but I, I would also admit myself that there's a lot of things I know. There's a lot of things I don't know about okay. my students, and so another way to look at it might be to say, okay, I don't. I, I'm never going to know my students well enough to get inside their head, right, and know exactly what type of activity is going to drive each student at e every single moment. That's never going to happen. So, so maybe I just try to offer enough variety and potentiality in my classroom, so with the hopes that 
students respond and they give me some indication based on their response that what I'm doing either is working or not. And it, looking at a more in a complex scenario where it's just about potentiality, it's more like, okay, here's the, 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 the environment that I'm going to try to create. Now go create type of thing. And you know, we're trying to just give them those opportunities. And again, it goes back to flipped learning too, because I can say, okay, you can either go here and work, you can either go here and work, or you can go here and work, and you can share this way or share this way, or you can receive feedback this way. Or in, because a lot of students I give, I always give my students options of receiving feedback from me, either through email, of course, in class or in my office, whatever. That's a very simple example, but the idea is saying, okay, you choose, right? How do you want to, you know, how, and sometimes I'll even tell my students, how much feedback do you want to re uh, receive from me? Again, in my case, it's writing, because most of my classes deal with writing. So I know from experience that some students do not like a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. I have other students that will ask me every single day, can you <laughs> get some more feedback, more feedback, more feedback, more feedback? Feedback. They want. They they thrive on that. Yeah. So for me, just that one instance of how much feedback do I give each student? I have no idea. I say, all right, you tell me. All right, I'm going to give everybody feedback, of course, right? But I'm going to say, okay, if you want more feedback from me, do this. In fact, in some states, I'll say, do you want less feedback? Or is this too much? I usually can tell right away if it's too much feedback. But it's really trying to be in tune of, in this case, how much feedback, how much. How, uh, yeah, how much uh, information, how many comments should I leave on their documents uh, so that I don't try, that I don't demotivate them, right, by giving them too much if, and, and make sure they're motivated enough if they want more feedback. So. And, and those are the parts where you have to know your students because uh, maybe I, I need to be clear in the idea that uh, my thought is not that you know your students to tell them what they should do or what, uh, or what they need. Or, or, or uh, you as a teacher saying, oh, uh, I know you so well that I know you have to do it this way or you have to do this in order to, to learn or that. No, it's not that, that uh, uh, the idea of knowing students. That would be the idea of understanding what can help your students to make their own decisions. Like, uh, like uh, knowing your students to know what can bring them confidence, as you were mentioning, as to share their writings or, or accept uh, or, or diminish the filters when getting the feedback. But my point here, though, Petey, is um, those decisions that I would make, I would make exactly the same decisions whether I knew nothing about my students or that I knew a lot about them. It's exactly the same. I, it, my point, my, the, maybe the extreme would be like, I don't even need to know my students. Why? Because all I need to do is give them choices. And right. choices, okay, maybe I come to know some about them, but I'm still not going to know them well, well enough to know. What, would, what, what kind of choices were that, were, uh, would they be? Uh, maybe they would be, I don't know if, if that would be the idea, to have different choices from different perspectives and profiles that you previously conceived in order to... Uh, ho uh, hopefully have students matching towards one or two of these different choices, right? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I'm not going to know if they're going to want to prefer to oh, write in yes. Google Doc throughout the week or maybe just upload it at the end of the week or to write in a notebook. I'm not right. going to know. And that could even change over the course of a semester. They could right. change on the amount of feedback that they want from me over the course of a unit. They may want a lot of feedback at the beginning and not so much at the end or vice versa or any anything in between. And that is just, I'll never know. I'll never know all of that. And no. I don't even, it doesn't bother me because I'm just telling them these are different ways that you can interact and, and, and you know, participate in this class. And within these, uh, you know, these... And and these ways you mentioned are, will come obviously from different uh, ideas, different approaches, different uh, different um, formats, different paths that they can take that that are that that you previously uh, or somebody along the line identify. You know, 
not because we want to match students there, but we, as you mentioned, we want to give them options. And maybe at the end, they're going to come up with something out of the box and find a different path from whichever option we present. And, and, I, and, and I understand in that in that sense. Uh, in, 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 in knowing your students, right? You may not need to know them as long as you understand the variety that you can offer people in general. Yeah, and I think we're seeing the same thing. I think that what I've seen is going back to our discussion we had, I think last week or two weeks ago, about uh, learning styles. Right, oh we, yeah. We didn't get into it a lot, but this idea of, and I've seen this, this is not related so much to our conversations, but I've seen that, uh, you know, some research, some student thesis, not from this year, but um, prior years, this focus on learning styles and the importance of trying to learn what those learning styles are from the students as a basis for designing a class. And that's kind of what I'm like, well, if so, is that what it means to know the student, to know kind of abstractly what their learning styles are and then Th this is kind of my yeah, yeah I get I totally okay. get in that sense and that's what that's why I mentioned like uh, is not knowing them to tell them what uh, this is what you need or this is what yeah because in that sense you would be even labeling students for good and uh, and everything you would do would go towards one thing and maybe the student yeah. and, and I agree on that too that uh, maybe the student at certain situations he is not doing the same thing he tends to do regularly or the way he he tends to do it or or along the line changes or there's there's a, a moment of transformation there's the famous click we always mention about and and and, and we teachers enforce the blocking of this uh, of this development from students i agree i agree on that and i think this open idea is given us a different perspective um, uh, in the sense that um, Mm, what we can see now in the classrooms when we have a teacher with the traditional idea, and this is something I struggle with fresh teachers, uh, pre-service teachers, they have the traditional idea that a class is coming into the class to put out some information for everybody from me, the way I plan it and I interpret it and I understand it, whether I know well the topic or may maybe I don't know the topic, but this is my, my exhibition of the topic. And then just ask the students, do you have any question? Which the regular answer is no. And then say, all right, now you are going to do this. Do it. Yeah. And, that's it. Yeah. and options are totally close. That's the kiss, that's the kiss of death question. Does, does everybody understand? All right, are there any questions? I mean, that's that's a question. No. <laughs> You can, yeah, you can never win from from that uh, that question. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, and we all do it, of course, right? But um, it's one of those things that's and, I, and, and, and be, myself when I say it. And and beyond the no answer, when they actually answer with a yes, there's a question. The question is, oh, teacher, so you show us these two sentences. So, do I use the first one or the second one? Right. I mean, again, towards the leading about about uh, whatever the teacher is is uh, intending, and and yes, I think uh, we we can find a point in between because there will be uh, times in which the students may feel that need of a little bit more of security and and control by the teacher, and and I always talk about controlling the class with my students, uh, but. Uh, but yes, uh, in a deeper level, it is not about controlling what the students will actually do with the language in total. But uh, as you mentioned, having this variety, uh, that's what I, what I focus on, the knowing your students in order to provide confidence, maybe some uh, language patterns, uh, different ways to be presented. Just, so just uh, that the student know that there are different options to, to follow. And, and he can try their own. And, uh, and maybe also uh, as uh, knowing your students as to know which uh, context at different level may intrigue uh, the student and, and make it uh, go deeper into the practice of the day. That's, I think that's the kind of sense in which uh, the knowing our students will help us. 
uh, to at least, uh, because maybe uh, I know they like this kind of music. And that day, they are not into the mood for music. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of either knowing them or just knowing the situation. Like, do we know that the what they're doing at that point is what they need to be doing? Right. I mean, as teachers, that's one thing we need to we need to know is okay. Are they doing the things that we want them to do? And we need to be have enough knowledge and skills to be able to say, okay. They are doing what, what they should be doing, like that we can recognize that as an educative experience or we can recognize that as a non-educative experience. And I right. think that, you know, whether we know, quote unquote, know the students or not, uh, our job is to be able to have that skill and knowledge base that we can say, yes, this w is working or no, this is not working and then make adjustments, whether in real time or in right. subsequent classes. And I think in a teacher program, teacher training program, and just in in-service teachers, as we are reflecting on our own practice and, and trying to prove that we are becoming more aware of of that and uh, making decisions like your topic uh, today of adapting. Which, yeah, I hope we can talk more about that either today or or in the future. But how we can, you know, both in the moment adapt and provide that support right. and and also plan for it in the future saying okay there was some issues here how can we provide uh, support or adapt maybe the flipped learning experience in a way that offers additional support for students who are struggling that are maybe more introvert or whatever and um, are accommodating those types of situations Right. Very, very interesting topic today, Ben. I think uh, I, I enjoy listening to, to this uh, article and the idea of the output-driven hypothesis. Uh, pretty much it matches a lot of the things uh, I, I've, been, I've been seeing. I've been learning from my students, actually, more than, uh, more than, more, more than enforcing because uh, I, I know I tend to do things that uh, match this output-driven hypothesis. But more than doing, I do them because I see them from themselves and I see they work and I see how they actually do it uh, uh, right now when the students are really into uh, the teachers, pre-service teachers, when they are really into planning and, and into the idea of actually achieving something with the students, uh, they come with pretty good ideas. Uh, by themselves, they uh, sometimes they don't even have the theoretical background for it, but they come with things that are really effective and that changes. Uh, uh, when I see it from a different perspective, maybe a little bit of a, a little bit more of experience, and and having seen different activities and comparing to the ones they bring sometimes nowadays, uh, I can see uh, all of these changes, and that's what I say. Uh, it matches totally what I've been learning uh, from my students. And, and uh, how I present now to them different options from what I saw before with other students. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I, I think that is the key is, is providing options, you know, providing the buffet, right? And they choose what kind of, which foods that they want to, to right. eat. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, I know we're getting kind of towards the end of it. I want to give a quick shout out to everyone. I, I know, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, that uh, we're concluding this semester, in fact, the year for some students. We're having some recent uh, students are in the eighth semester of our English uh, language training program at the Universidad de Fama de Aguascalientes. They're finishing their uh, thesis uh, research. And uh, I want to invite anyone who's doing research. Uh, we haven't really uh, extended a specific invitation of this type before, but if you're doing research, if you've conducted research and you want to share that, whether you're a recent or soon to be graduate or in-service teacher, uh, we'd love to have you on to talk about your research. Um, if it's related to education in any way, that's we're always looking for topics to talk about. So if you want to share your research with us, uh, we certainly extend that invitation. Just let us know. I think the easiest way would be to leave a message uh, or a comment in our Facebook page. Uh, English uh, teacher uh, learning uh, cast and uh, let us know if you'd like to share your experiences uh, with us 
and um, we're always looking for people to join us in the broadcast. Give us some feedback. Let us know what your thoughts are. Even if you disagree with us, it's all good. Let us know what your ideas are. Um, and you know, this week focusing mainly on output-driven hypothesis and, and the writing uh, skill in particular. Let us know what your thoughts are, how you approach writing in your own uh, English context. I uh, would uh, certainly love to learn more about how you are dealing with that. And um, yeah, Pity, I think this we're pretty much uh, going to conclude today's broadcast. Any closing thoughts? Well, just thanking all people that joins through the transmission of the different media to Claudia, Rocio, Annie, the floor, to Alma, Alma Zaragoza just join us, and people that pass by, Daniel, uh, Randy, and some others that, that pass by. Today we had a couple of interventions also by Alma Lucia. Uh, thank you very much about that. That's what we want. We want just to put things on the table from our perspective, which is uh, exclusively art. <laughs> And, and it's shared so you can take whatever you like and you can uh, make comments on that. And, and you can ask questions and you can ask, ask about, uh, tell us what you want to uh, uh, hear about. If you want us to invite somebody or if you want to come or join through the Hangout, we can do it. And uh, I'm really glad uh, they're spreading the word and they're sharing the video. I would encourage you guys, uh, the ones that are sharing the video in Facebook Live, Go to the source. The source has a better view and a way, a lot better sound. Uh, uh, Benjamin is seen in first plane uh, and myself too. And the audio is way better. And uh, when we share screens and the articles, uh, they are readable, which are not when we are here and and when you are just looking in the Facebook Live. And uh, I think we we'll start to think about how to how to uh, evolve this a little bit. Uh, because I, I see uh, you are taking Facebook as a, as a way uh, of a uh, more dynamic way of of uh, sharing and, and making comments. But uh, the I'm also monitoring at the same time the YouTube transmission, the original source, and my personal web page transmission, just in case, and the teacher learning cast page, just in case you have comments and you post things there. Uh, we have the chats open there, there too, okay? So the, the, this, the transmission I'm making in the Facebook Live, it's a secondary transmission with a worse view of it, but it's just for you to know that there's an original source in which you can make comments and we can also interact just as we are doing right now. Thank you, Ben. I, I was really glad. I liked the topic a lot, so that's why I, 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 I let it run and, and kept on that. And uh, I think we will need to come back to it some uh, somewhere in the future, some when, some at some point in the future. Absolutely, Pity. I always enjoy these conversations, and uh, I want to thank everybody for for watching the live broadcast as well as uh, the recording. And uh, I think we'll stop and we'll conclude today's broadcast there. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Pity, and we'll see you in the next broadcast. See you next broadcast. Alma, we'll be glad to receive the documents you want to send us just as examples and have a talk about it. We'll let you know through inbox. Uh, you can send it uh, to me or Benjamin in our Facebook pages through inbox, and we'll let you know uh, the day we, we may take uh, and, and uh, go over the analysis or, or whatever uh, we can do with it uh, to share with people. Thank you very much, everybody. Keep on learning.